Well, welcome everyone to Cape Ann Art Waves, coming to you by way of 1623 Studios, located in Gloucester, Massachusetts. I'm Christine Fisher, your host today of this very special program. We're so grateful to our listeners and to our generous sponsors for their tremendous support of our show. Our sponsors are Prince Insurance Agency, MK Fisher Visual Artist, Martha K. Anger of Compass Real Estate Brokerage, Protective Packaging, Cape Ann Savings Bank, and Common Pro. A big nod of thanks to all. I also want to give a big shout out to our partner, Sea Arts, for doing such a terrific job of the marketing, and to 1623 Studios, who broadcast our show. And of course, to my partner in crime, Jacqueline Gannam DeFalco, my fellow co-producer and co-host. Our gratitude also goes to our local musicians, Steve Lacey and Pat Verga, for their contribution of the music. It takes a village to put on, to put on Cape Ann Art Waves. Jackie and I have had the privilege to interview upwards of 75 talented art champions to include artists and gallerists who have contributed richness to our cultural community here on Cape Ann. Cape Ann Art Waves was started in March of 2020 with a specific mission to give artists and gallerists a platform for sharing their artistic journey and work during an unprecedented time in our recent history brought on by the pandemic. Live opportunities for exhibiting and sharing work dried up overnight, as we all know. Each of us was challenged with finding our own path for comfort and inspiration. The arts for many paved a way forward. For Cape Ann Art Waves, technology and our willing guests helped to forge such a path. Today, I will be hosting my last one-on-one -on -one conversation, as we'll be bringing our show to a close at the end of this year, with one new last episode to air in January that Jackie and I will co-host together. At that time, we'll be sharing several exciting announcements about the future of Cape Ann Art Waves, so please, please tune in. I can't think of a more perfect guest to close out my series than today's artist, Judy Rotenberg. The Cape Ann Art Museum here in Gloucester hosted a solo exhibition of Judy's work this past summer. I knew Judy was the one when I visited and saw her breathtaking collection of 30 glorious paintings. Her work has been described as ebullient, joyful, fresh, and uplifting. The perfect note for today and for moving forward. Judy believes that, that beauty brings joy, as do I. I'm going to read Judy's bio. And while I do that, I've got two stunning pieces that I want to show. Um, the first piece was actually used on the cover of the Cape Ann Museum's catalog honoring Judy's show and has been acquired by the Cape Ann Museum as part of their permanent collection. And the name of the piece is Still Life and Motif in Cadman red light. The second piece is titled Lilies and Peonies. Judy Rotenberg is an American artist who lives and works on Cape Ann and in Boston, Massachusetts. A lifelong summer resident of Rockport and a highly respected artist, Judy works on a large scale creating vibrant canvases that capture the fragility and, and strength of life through floral still lifes. It is a genre that Rotenberg has perfected over the past 40 years and which continues to captivate her today. A daughter of the late American Impressionist Harold Rotenberg, Judy Rotenberg has immersed herself in art since childhood. She earned her Bachelor of Fine Arts from Boston University where she studied with Reed Kay and David Aronson. She also studied privately with Francois Gall in Paris and Henry Schwartz in Boston. On Cape Ann, Judy benefited from instruction from Robert Alcalay, Barbara Swan, and George Demetrius. Judy is a classically trained and accomplished and accomplished at portraiture and landscape as well as still lifes. And in 2012 to 2013, she had the great honor of being selected, and I mean great honor, as a copyist at the Louvre in Paris. Working primarily in acrylic, Judy Rotenberg's paintings are unabashedly beautiful, alive with color and motion. 
Each composition is vibrant and fresh and represents a new challenge for Judy. Her canvases are rich in detail from the foreground and the table on which a vase and bouquet sit through the center of the canvas and its explosion of blossoms to the top of the composition where Judy often includes a view across her studio or out across Rockport Harbor. I also want to add that Judy served as a past president of the Rockport Art Association and Museum and her family has owned the Square Circle Gallery in Dock Square in Rockport. Welcome Judy. Welcome. And first, I want to thank you, Christine, for including me in your series. It's a great honor. Oh, you bet. I'm just thrilled that you're here and you're, you're absolutely the perfect guest for us to, to wind up on. So thank you. Thank you. Judy, let's, let's start off. You know, you and I had this wonderful conversation leading up to today's uh, conversation. And I was so taken by the fact that you knew at a very young age, at the age of four, that you wanted to be an artist. Why don't we use that as a good jumping off point? <laughs> okay, well, I grew up in a house where there were always paints and crayons and um, we were taken to museums and galleries because as you mentioned, my father was Harold Rotenberg, uh, an American impressionist. And if you grew up in a family of musicians, you probably have lots of records and sheet music and stuff. But I just knew immediately that was for me, I was going to be a painter. Mm -hmm. uh, I am impressed that uh, you were able to thrive and, and not absorb any pressure. Obviously, your, your dad was terrific about not setting any expectations that were overbearing. I mean, how wonderful is that? What a gift. Well, it wasn't just my father, it was my mother who, uh, my father was concerned about a young person taking classes with someone because he was afraid they would be unduly influenced so their own personality wouldn't come out in their paintings. Mm -hmm. But my mother said, no, this child is gonna get lessons. So I'm a product of taking lessons. So let's, let's refer to this wonderful family shot that you have. I think this is the perfect segue for us to show this wonderful shot of you as a, as a kid with your brother and sister and your folks. Do you wanna talk about this a little bit? Yes, um, there's the three J's, my sister Janie, me, and my brother John. And my parents are dressed up, they're going to a costume ball. I don't know if it was at the Art Association, but it was somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, we were just a very loving, close family. Yes, you can really see that in the picture. You all look so happy and, and so relaxed. Um, Judy, let's talk a little bit about your years at, at uh, Boston University because you were really drilled in the fundamentals, correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, at Boston University, we ground our own pigments. We made Damar varnish. We stretched our canvases. Uh, we were very thoroughly grounded in the materials. And also there was a design teacher, a composition, a color, a sculpture, graphics. So you, you got to experience all different levels, besides which there was also a strong art history program as part of Boston University. It was um, an excellent place to learn and quite different today where I've had friends that have gone to say Mass College of Art, where they learned to think about what their painting means. We didn't, we didn't have any of that. Mm. So when we graduated from BU after having done four years of brown earth tone paintings, trying to get the proportions correct and, and the design, you know, uh, correct, that then we were left with, well, no one wants just Brown <laughs> studies of figures and things. And we had to figure out on our own then uh, what we were gonna do with, with the um, skills we had learned. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is a, a natural opportunity for us to talk about this beautiful piece because your training was so rich and so deep and so thorough. Uh, let's talk about Rembrandt because you, honestly, it sounds to me, we could not have done that quite so beautifully, but hadn't been for your early training. 
Well, I tried for a long time to get to be a copyist because my daughter and her husband were living in Paris and she was about to have a baby and I wanted to spend some time there. But I kept on writing to the uh, principal of the uh, copyist program and she didn't respond. And I went to see her in person and I came with Eddie once she didn't respond to me. But then I brought my daughter and she finally said to me, well, you use acrylics. We don't use acrylics. You have to use oil here. So I said, perfect. I trained in oil. That's great. <laughs> and I brought her a box of French chocolates and she accepted me in the program. <laughs> It is such a beautiful, beautiful painting. Really stunning. Well, we actually went to Amsterdam to buy the C uh, Rembrandt studio. I bought Rembrandt paints. I just immersed myself in, in that look. Mm -hmm. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, much earlier in your practice, you painted landscapes and portraits. Uh, I'd like to know, I'm sure our viewers would like to know, how did you decide to paint flowers, Judy? What was your source of inspiration? Because it has marked a very strong change of direction. Well, flowers represent for me, our lives really. It, they're fragile, they're beautiful. They give you a lot of joy, but you always know it's, it's not gonna last a long time. And, and I think that they're available and you can set them up the way you want. I've always been interested in design. I was an abstract painter for a while. Mm -hmm. And with flowers, you can move the red here or the yellow there. You can compose your own composition with flowers. And that's what I think is so wonderful about them. So Judy, we have another piece that we'd like to focus on. And um, before we close out and begin to talk more thoroughly and deeply about your art practice, this is this wonderful image of you in front of your gallery, which I think is where I first met you so many years ago uh, when I had an office also in Boston. Talk to us about this piece. Well, first I'm gonna say that was in 1971. And in 1966, I had all, already opened a gallery in Rockport with my brother, John, the Square Circle. Mm -hmm. And that gallery, we used to joke and say it was a gallery with a sense of humor because besides my paintings, in those days, I was doing watercolors on rice papers. We did things like there were shot glasses, Andy Warhol uh, glasses with uh, pictures of um, Campbell's soup cans and that type of thing but Boston was a more serious gallery. And I carried many, first of all, I started in a basement store that wasn't rented and I saw I could sell my paintings. And then I went upstairs where the picture is taken. And um, I thought, isn't this great? I'll paint and I'll be able to sell them. But it doesn't work out because you're right in the middle of a painting and something and someone comes in. Besides which, when you paint in your gallery, you're influenced by what people like. And that wasn't a good thing. So when I couldn't keep up with the demand anymore, I started bringing in artists. And I had Sigmund Jankowski, Charlie Mabali, just a bunch, Harold Rotenberg, Jason Berger, a, a group of artists that I knew from Cape Ann. Mm -hmm. Well, it was an absolutely stunning gallery, very sophisticated and you are just a very welcoming gallerist. So I have fond memories of, of going in there. Thank um, you. I, I'd like to know also, before we sign off and talk more Can about- Can I just say it lasted for 40 years. In the last 10 years, my daughter, Abigail Ross Goodman ran the gallery and she brought in more innovative new age uh, type of art, which was very successful also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's a good long time. Think about that. I mean, what, what a run, you know, especially in downtown Boston on Newbury Street. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit before we move into your practice again. Um, here on Cape Ann, and obviously you were the past president of, of uh, one of the past presidents of Rockford Art, so Art Association and Museum. And you mentioned those artists that you exhibited in your Boston gallery. Mm -hmm. Judy, with Cape Ann having such a strong uh, tradition around the Cape Ann school and around supporting, you know, maritime themes, did you feel any pressure at all? 
to switch I, up? I did feel the pressure, but it didn't speak to me. That's not, I love that fabulous, but it's not me. Yeah. And so the desire to be me was stronger than to go with the hurt. I love it. That's great. What a good response that is. Um, okay, let's get into talking about your art practice. And I'd like to start out with a quote by your daughter, Abigail, Abigail Ross Goodman. Uh, and this is a wonderful quote that I picked up in the uh, Cape Ann Museum catalog. Painting for her is both an engine for generating a feeling of aliveness and contentment, as well as a channel for it. I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Abigail's a wonderful writer. Oh my goodness, wonderful writer. She's a, you know, a wonderful spokesperson also. We should mention that Abigail uh, is the principal at, at uh, Goodman Toft, which focuses on curatorial and advisory, correct? Correct, but I believe it's pronounced Taft, like President Taft. Oh, Taft, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's get into your art practice, Judy, and maybe to lead us off to kind of anchor this discussion, we have this wonderful image of your dad at Azizel. Okay, that is. My dad would come and stay with me for a couple of weeks during the summer, and he had gone out painting in the morning. He was over 90 in those days, and he came back for lunch, and he said, there's a wonderful boat in Gloucester, ship in Gloucester. After lunch, we have to go paint that. So we drove to Gloucester and the ship had left, but my dad was standing in front of a red truck. And I said, well, I'll do him instead. And if you notice in the painting, he has a plaid top and plaid bottoms because he felt if he got paint on it, no one would notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a wonderful painting. And I remember meeting your, your father at the Square Circle Gallery of all places. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit more specifically about your practice. If I understand it correctly, your typical canvas size is 60 by 48. Is that about right? Um, it's, yes, 48 by 60 or 60 yeah, by 40. Very, very large. large. You know, I wanted to share those dimensions to give folks such a, a, a visual, you know, especially for those that didn't have a chance to see your work, to walk in at the Cape Bend Museum, to walk into the museum, into your exhibition, and to your the collection of, of your paintings was so powerful. I mean, I was just absolutely enthralled. And the size, you know, in particular. Um, talk to us a little bit more about how you view your florals. You have said they're not florals in the traditional sense, rather they are color compositions. That, that's absolutely right. And um, I, I Something in a floral arrangement delights my eye that makes me want to paint it. And I also am given um, many flowers for uh, birthdays, anniversaries, things like that, Mother's Day. And they get moved around to make them more interesting to me. But some little, it's like my eyes paint a picture. I just look around a room and there's something that interests me. There's something that delights me and I want to have everyone else delighted by it. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's part of it. But my actual uh, work process is I do paint large. I'm actually the, the surprise at the end of this. I'm going to tell you my next one is going to be six by six. Just this morning I had someone <laughs> hang wow. out nail the canvas into my uh, studio wall in Boston. Wow. So I'm excited to try that. Oh, yes, you should be. You should be. Let's let's look at two uh, more images, Judy, because of this is really in keeping with talking about your process. We have this lovely study in blue followed by the finished piece, Franklin's Green. You always approach your canvas, if I understand it correctly, by doing a, a sketch, right? I would say 90% of the time, but I'm not always anything. But I do love to draw. And mm -hmm. I'm still using the earth colors from uh, college to, to outline it. But now I draw with blues or purples or something like that. And you can see in the image that um, I have 
I have the bones, the skeleton of the picture done. That's the most exciting time for me because I do not know then, should I leave it? I love the drawing many times and I just don't want to go forward. Mm. But some things call for more. Yeah. And so I go forward from there. And as fast as that first drawing is and as exciting as that first drawing is, the challenge is to keep that excitement for the days that come later as I'm working on adding, you know, heft to it, color, more, more intricate things going on. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you can see, you can judge for yourself looking at the two. Should I have just kept the first yeah. or, or should I go on? And um, that's also always a conversation I have it in my head because if I don't like the first drawing, I, I work till I do like it. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes a certain amount of bravery, I think. <laughs> I think it takes. <laughs> I think it takes a certain amount of courage, right? I mean, there's there's risk there always when you're adding and evolving your work. Uh, and what I enjoy about these two pieces that we're showing is that we see the the study in your studio and it helps us get a glimpse uh, of your studio as well with your beautiful arrangement next to it, followed by the finished piece. That's the Boston studio. And if you look at that piece carefully, you can see that it's an abstract painting except for where I've developed three of the flowers. Mm -hmm. But if you took out those three flowers, it, it's a, an interesting abstract composition. Mm -hmm. Um, you've referred to your work, Judy, as collective portraits of individual flowers themselves and that you go for the feeling. And I, I loved your comment around the fact that you're not necessarily, uh, your goal is not necessarily to give the viewer all the information, but to just kind of give them uh, uh, enough so that they can fill in the blanks. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, yes, I think my most successful paintings are the ones where the, the viewer's mind, it participates when they look at it. And I give them hints and ideas what direction I want them to go in, but that the viewer gets to finish, mm -hmm. finish painting the picture. Yes, yeah. Um, I'd like to also talk a little bit about the importance you place, because this really struck a chord with me, the importance you place on observation. And I'm going to read a quote. What is clear across all aspects of our practice is that primary observation is as critical as composition and color. Okay. Um, <laughs> It's true, but I don't know how to explain it more than that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, that's okay. We'll we'll continue to to move on. I just think, I I, I think that observation is, um, it is such a a powerful tool, if you will. Uh, and my mother, I will say, just to you know, contribute a personal note, my mother uh, enjoyed painting and from the time I was a little girl, we would go for walks. And she was always pointing out shapes and color and definition. And uh, for me today, I attribute my mother in helping me observe and absorb, so. Christine, that's interesting because I do that all the time also. And my father did it, but differently. He was always checking on values. Is this house behind that hill? I don't. I don't do value. Mm -hmm. I I do color, and wherever I go, my eyes are painting the picture. Whether I have the paintbrush in my hand or not, whatever it's seeing, it, it, it's suggesting painting in my head. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we want to go on and cover a couple of more beautiful pieces. And the next piece that we're going to talk about, Judy, is I have found the one. And I'm going to read another quote just to lead us off because I found this so spiritual. This is another quote by your daughter, Abigail. My mother prays on and off the canvas. I thought that was beautiful. Thank you. Uh, 
Yes. And I, I had been um, at a service and we had read the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. And it inspired me, those quotes, to try to express that feeling in a painting. And the one behind me is actually the first one I did in that series. Oh. Uh, the, song of song. the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing is come. And that was done in Rockport on my uh, mantle in, in my house there because I didn't have a large enough um, easel to hold it. Mm. And the other one is I have found the one in whom my heart delights, my mm. soul delights, excuse mm. me. And um, I, I, I just think it's beautiful, beautiful song. Mm -hmm. And um, I did a series of them. Very poignant. I mean, when I, again, uh, hearkening back to the uh, Cape Ann Museum exhibition, um, it really had an impact on me. Let's talk about composition of orange gerbert. So uplifting. Is there anything well, special that you'd like to uh, address there with this one? Yes, that was a complicated um, painting to do. It was flowers that were sent to me, but I didn't like the composition. And Eddie, my husband came in and rearranged it for me. And if you notice, there are things in front, there's a, a cup of uh, orchids in front. And when, if you look at my paintings, whenever Eddie's involved, he <laughs> always adds a little vase in the front of the composition with one flower or something, but, but that I call the Eddie touch. But those were very strong colors to unify in a painting. It was a challenging painting, but I was happy with it when I got there. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. Um, I also want to add that you have, have spoken of controlled freedom, paint, painting the lights and the shadows of each flower. And what I think is you know, also so interesting is that with this controlled freedom, your work is so spontaneous and so full of movement. Well, that, that is, there are two challenges. One is my head always speaks to me about the way I've been trained, the way to make it look just the way it is. And my other part is the desire for you to feel that excitement I feel. Mm -hmm. So um, those two things are always going on. And composition and design are, number, are one of the number ones for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you do such a brilliant job of conveying that excitement. I definitely feel it when I look at your work. Let's talk about another piece, View from Your Studio, which truly speaks to me of summer. I love this, this particular piece because I know the, the perspective. I mean, well, I have a nice gallery in Rockport and the front of it, I, I just sort of line up the paintings I'm working in on and because I like to uh, see them all together. And actually I think my show in Gloucester was successful because somewhere in my mind, I'm painting them as a group. Mm -hmm. And I have this little teeny space in the back. You can see the painting and I'm in this tiny little back space and there's the arrangement and the view of the motif behind. I love it, I love it. And, and that is um, that is my garden behind the house, behind the studio and behind my house. And there's also um, our dog there. She's dead now. You see that little brown speck to the left of the table. Uh -huh. And it's just a restful, beautiful place that makes me feel, even though Rockport's so busy, it's a piece of nature there. Oh yeah, you have an absolutely gorgeous location. Um, I'd like to talk about sunflowers, Judy. And okay. I think this, this is a wonderful example of how you've teased the viewer with your background, but you have not given us all the information there. Okay, well, this was a painting that was drawn with blue. And this was a big decision. I loved it when it was done in blue. And this was not done in the studio those flowers were on the dining room, the table you just saw in the last painting. Should I leave it? Should I go? Should I blah, blah, blah. I decided to, 
the yellow of the sunflowers was so perfect that I decided to add the color. Mm. And you notice there's a little red boat behind. Mm -hmm. And my father would always say, any painting is improved with a touch of red. <laughs> and I added the two dropped petals because I, I, I wanted a touch more realism in the painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask, because I think our viewers are going to be curious about this too. How do you go about your arrangements? You enlist your family, do you, to help you pick and make arrangements? Does Ed help you? Well, um, kids help you, grandkids. So, sometimes it's um, my children sending me things for Mother's Day. Sometimes I love them just the way they are. But yep. and sometimes I just we get flowers from the farmers market and just stick them in a vase. Okay. Or we have loads of flowers in our garden. Sometimes we pick those. Sometimes it's a combination of all of them. And Eddie loves to arrange flowers for me. He'll go and, and organize a thing of flowers. But as I said, if he did it, you'll see a little vase in front. <laughs> That's his touch, <laughs> as you say. That's um, his touch. <laughs> Judy, I had heard, I believe, also in your wonderful in dialogue conversation with your daughter, Abigail, um, that you listen to music. Am I right about that? When you're painting? You are correct. And I have to listen to the same artist. It doesn't have to be the exact same song through the, through the whole painting. And um, I've changed. I used to listen to the tenors. I used to listen to Bruce Springsteen. I used to listen to um, Susan Marches, just different things, but you sort of feel it in the painting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, well, it helps to build up that excitement, I believe. Um, before we uh, wrap up, I would love, we have two more images to talk about, but I'd also love for you to share, because you had such good advice. Um, you, you, through your journey, you've had your hiccups. You've, especially when you were, I'm sure, younger in your career, you were rejected from various uh, shows, as we all have been. What's your advice around that? Because here you are absolutely thriving, so successful. Share with us well, how we can learn okay. from your I, experience. I have, I have been rejected several times from the Rockwood Art Association when I was a kid and then became president. <laughs> yeah. I had a painting rejected that was in, because I, I'm members of different art organizations besides rejected from a show that was in the museum and everyone loved it. Um, my advice is just keep on doing your, your, uh, your work. Mm -hmm. And my father used to say, um, people who do the worst, who, people who paint a lot of bad paintings become the best artist. And I think you just have to keep on working and ignore uh, what the noise around you and just, just do your thing. Just keep yeah, on perseverance. Perseverance. You know, perseverance is the most important thing. Nothing else. Genius doesn't matter. Um, intelligence doesn't matter. Just keep on, just yeah. keep on doing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's really important for all of us to be, to hear and to be reminded of. Uh, Judy, we've got two more images. I absolutely adore this image of you and Ed laughing. <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything in particular you want to say about this? It's just a stunning shot of both of you well i love it too it's just joyful yes. it's joyful yeah it's really joyful thank you uh, and uh as we close out here i also love this last shot your family on safari well in 2019 2020 for christmas vacation we took the 29 of us eddie and myself our six children, their spouses, or almost spouses, and our 15 grandchildren, and went on a wonderful safari. But sometimes people will say, well, what are you gonna do with all your paintings? <laughs> and I say, <laughs> I, I have 27 people who <laughs> <laughs> like the work. Oh yeah, you have a large family and you look so <laughs> spirited in that shot. It's a great shot. Um, I want to share for our listeners that you can learn more and see Judy's beautiful work at judyrotenbergstudio.com. That's her URL. And I want to thank you, Judy. What a pleasure to have you on the show. You are just absolutely the perfect last guest. 
So thank you so much. And thanks to your family for all that you do to support Cape Ann and contrib contribute to keeping the arts thriving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. You've made this a lovely process. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, I'm so glad. And as we close out, I want to thank our videographer, Anders Johnson, who does such a phenomenal job uh, with our, uh, our videos. And I want to thank all of my guests over the last two and a half years. It's been nothing short of a privilege. I've learned from all of you. I've been inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays, Judy. Thank you. And happy Thanksgiving to you.